like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Rock Patel. I'm one of the co-chairs uh, for the LSRS Education Committee. Um, and my fellow co-chair, Scott Daffner, is on here as well. Um, this is the first of the webinars for this year. And uh, we decided to talk about SI fusions, but we wanted to talk uh, about more than just uh, degenerative pathology with the SI joint. We wanted to chat about uh, traumatic indications and uh, also the SI joint and deformity surgery. Um, so to that end, we have a great panel um, over here with us today. Um, the first speaker is to be Jad Khalil. Uh, Jad is the director of the Spine Surgery Fellowship at Beaumont, um, and he's uh, in our backyard, and we're really lucky to, to have him here. Um, next is uh, Bill Cross. Uh, Woody is uh, at Mayo Clinic. Uh, I met Woody a little while ago at CL Science, Science Foundation. He's actually not a spine surgeon, but he's an orthopedic trauma surgeon that specializes in SI fusions, and I've never heard anyone so knowledgeable about the SI joint as Woody. So thanks for joining. Also, Matt Coleman is at Rush University at Midwest Orthopedics, uh, and uh, he's an orthopedic spine surgeon um, who has a particular interest for bigger cases, oncology, deformity. And he's going to chat uh, about uh, the SI joint and, and deformity. Hey, my name is Jad Khalil. I'm an ortho spine surgeon in, uh, in Michigan. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have Dr. Patel and his colleagues. I send them all the tough cases that uh, I don't really enjoy doing anymore. So um, these are my disclosures. I do uh, consult, teach, and also participate in product uh, product design for uh, for SI SI joint um, fusion. But uh, none of the product, none of those products are are uh, shown here tonight. So we're going to keep this very uh, agnostic and uh, hopefully free of bias. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy, just kind of some generalities. Who is our patient for SI fusion? Uh, how to diagnose it? Indications for surgery, and a little bit touch on the clinical evidence. I know it's a lot to pack in uh, in uh, 15, 20 minutes, but uh, but we'll try to provide an overview. Happy to answer any questions later. The first thing to know is the SI joint is, is a true joint. So some uh, people don't think of it as a true joint, but it is a, a joint lined by the diarthrodia joint lined by hyaline cartilage, but it's held together by real strong and stiff ligaments. Over age, these ligaments can, can kind of degenerate just like uh, any other ligaments in the body that can lead to some of the pathologies that we treat. It's important to note when you look at the lateral aspect of the sacrum, uh, where before I was trained to do uh, any SI work, and uh, I used to think about, always look at the body of the sacrum because that's where we put pedicle screws. But if I go back to my days when I was an orthopedic resident, uh, we did a lot of uh, SI work for trauma. And as uh, Dr. Cross will point out, the joint is a little more anterior than you think. So when you're looking at that articular uh, joint area, that's more ventral. And when you're looking at a lateral, sometimes my residents that are coming on service will freak out when we're trying to put a screw that's on the lateral lining up with the anterior aspect of the body, but it is in fact in, in the joint. So it's just something to keep in mind and just kind of look at your spine model and try to look at the imaging, try to understand it later. There are three main categories of patients that we treat for SI pathology and the most common one, and the one that kind of led me to be interested, to start getting interested in the SI joint is the one on the right side, post-spinal fusion. Um, I have the privilege to uh, practice in an area with a group that has been uh, active in spine surgery for, for years, for at least maybe 40 years or so. And so in addition to seeing my own patients uh, come back with problems, I've seen uh, uh, some, some of the, a lot of the patients from my uh, former colleagues and mentors that, um, that they have successful fusions, but come back with persistent pain. And these are the these are the patients that first I started getting interested in treating what's going on with them. The fusion looks good and evidence points more to the SI joint. The other two categories are trauma. And you'll often see somebody who um, doesn't have any other risk factors, but had a bad fall typically on their side, um, slipped on the ice, etc. And that led to that degenerative cascade, just like any any other joints in the body. And the one not to forget about is also uh, pre pregnancy or postpartum. That is, um, and, I'll, and I'll see one, I'll see every few months, I'll see a typical postpartum. You have to ask the right question, excuse me, started after uh, having a baby. And if you don't ask, the, that correlation can often be missed. 
Now, in those patients, like I said, with chronic, what's, what's believed to be chronic low back pain, there's anywhere between 15 and 30% believed to at least have part of that etiology related to the SI joint. So you always want to be thinking about it. And if you don't think about it, you'll miss it. And, uh, and sometimes it is multifactorial, but uh, related to facet disease, disc disease, et cetera. But um, you don't want to miss the, the, the possibility that there's an SI problem because the treatment's a little bit different. Now, this is an interesting meta-analysis that was just published last year and uh, looked at all the all commoner spinal fusions, and they found that the incidence of SI joint degeneration, radiographic degeneration, is almost 40%. But not only that, the incidence of one about one out of four, 24%, has, has actually SI joint pain, and these are patients, uh, so post-spinal fusion patients. In addition, the more fusion you do, so the more fused segments, the more the, that incidence of SI, SI joint degeneration and pain. And that kind of makes sense because uh, you're kind of transitioning a really long, stiff level arm where, uh, um, next to the joint. And, um, and we've seen it. I mean, typically I'll see, I'll see a lot of the old L1 to S1 uh, fusions that did well initially, then 10 years later or seven years later have horrible looking SI joints and they respond to the injections, to the uh, treatment, et cetera. And like I said, this was kind of the first category of patients that I started getting interested in. Now, how do we diagnose it? Um, history, it, history and physical is, is almost everything. I, would say, I was going to say everything, but it's almost everything. So first of all, the history, they need to have one of those risk factors, in my opinion. Very rarely have I ever seen somebody without any risk factors having true SI joint disease. Typically, it's, it ends up being something else and very rarely leads to any surgical treatment. So um, in, in the physical examination, one of the most important tests, in my opinion, is to ask them to point with one finger to the area of most of, of the, uh, the epicenter of the pain. And you know, typically, a lot, of, a lot of time, patients try to kind of make a big circle and say it's all around here. And if you try, if you try ask them to be more specific, what hurts when you put weight on that specific side? What hurts when, you, when you're going downstairs, when you get down from a car? If they point to that area, a centimeter, a centimeter intramedial from the PSIS, which is kind of the, it's called the, the Horton test, um, is pretty specific. And I, we do see this in clinical practice. Now, the SI joint provocative testing, this is something that uh, you need to learn if you want to diagnose SI joint. And they go through a series of five tests, typically. Um, and this is beyond the scope of this webinar, but typically when we uh, teach our residents and fellows and teach courses, we demonstrate those. The physical therapists are actually very good at these. And let, I learned a lot from collaborating with my own therapist. We usually leave the Gainsland's test at the end, and I'll do the first four that are pretty quick to do. And if the if the four or three out of four are, are positive, I skip the last one, which can be quite painful. Now, three out of five tests, so typically you will we'll have three or four for true SI, that leads to a higher suspicion um in um in that that the problem may be related to the SI joint combined with the proper history and pointing to the right um uh, to the right area uh, that to me is the next step would be an injection and when i do an injection or when we typically recommend doing the injection by one of our interventional people um the injection is extremely specific i recommend at least at most two says two uh, two cc's of lidocaine one percent or half percent without any steroids and uh, the injection is diagnostic we give the patients a sheet and it's a pain sheet that they need to fill their pain level before hour one two three four etc after the injection and we're looking for 75 percent relief which is the nas criteria to uh to uh recommend uh, further treatment now we typically do always always do two injections so one injection is not enough and we always do two diagnostic injections. In our practice, I always recommend also trying some therapeutic injections with steroids, and that goes straight to surgery. And, um, and that's kind of our protocol. So two injections. Sometimes if, if they had relief with one, not with the other, we'll do three injections. Sometimes if it's really ambiguous, we'll send them for a CT-guided injection. So we will uh, really vet those patients out before recommending anything. And then I'll recommend as many therapeutic injections as they want, and typically... When my pain doctors are seeing those patients, it's not like I ask for a steroid injection, send it back to me. I say, no, take them, treat them. And those that fail treatment, uh, we'll, we'll see them again. As far as surgical treatment, I think uh, a lot of us orthopedic uh, surgeons are familiar with some older techniques or some that we've seen in the book, the open uh, SI joint procedures. 
but for the purposes of uh, this talk and kind of in this day and age, we're talking about the minimum invasive uh, SI joint fixation procedure, SI, uh, SI joint fusion procedure. How is it done? So um, again, this is not uh, meant to be a uh, comprehensive um, uh, guide to how to do the procedure. Impor I'm just going to go over the, re the really important and vital parts of the procedure, which to me is, first of all, positioning and imaging. And if you're doing this, uh, this surgery under fluoroscopy, you want to really have the perfect images before you even uh, make an incision. And to me, that's the perfect lateral. You see the sciatic notches are lined, uh, ailer line is, uh, are lined up. The perfect inlet and outlet view. The inlet is uh, in the middle screen, outlet view on the, on the far lateral screen. Typically, we give them a bowel prep. We want to be able to see the foramina and uh, really uh, know what we're doing. A lot of those procedures are done at outpatient surgery centers now, nowadays, and, um, and that's what we do. Uh, for most of them. So we really want to make sure that uh, we can see what we're doing. And then uh, the procedure goes uh, pretty smoothly, typically. So uh, the, you uh, draw a line down uh, down the sacral body, and that kind of gives us our, our inlet view, and then line down the ailer line. And we want to make sure to be caudal with all screws to that ailer line. Otherwise, you can irritate the L5 root. And um, this is where the looking at the spine model, looking at your imaging can be very helpful. Then typically you'll place one pin, just uh, caudal to that arrow line, and that's one pin down to bone. We try and make it a dot so it goes uh, straight. And then I place, place two more pins and uh, then check your inlet, outlet, make sure your ladder to, to the frame now. And then um, here, this is a, you know, depending on the system you're using, uh, some systems allow you to decorticate the joint. Some systems just transfix the joint, and then you end up in putting your screws. Again, some screws have those little caps that allow some compression, and some don't. Some screws have self-harvesting uh, kind of properties, uh, coating, et cetera. And uh, so that's um, so that's how it will look. Like this screw, for example, the middle screw was, they were too close, so I didn't use one of those set caps for one of them. And that's how it looks on the lateral. Again, you look at that ventral screw, you think, oh my God, it's outside the sacral body, but it is in the sacroiliac joint. And that's kind of the outline of the sacroiliac joint that you start getting familiar with looking at it. Now, beware always, this is actually one of uh, my patients that I was just getting ready to do the procedure of the surgery center, no navigation or anything there. Obviously, I just have a fluoro. And uh, sure enough, I missed a, uh, a uh, Bertolotti or a transitional anatomy here that you see on the on the left side if you look in PA, right side if you look in AP, and um, right there. And uh, but those procedures are doable with fluoro. It's uh, you gotta you know there is a little bit of modification of the technique. You just gotta make sure it really stay below that ALO line. And uh, but better off if you know beforehand, if you pay attention uh, to um, uh, follow the technique described by Dr. Patel and, and his team. Uh, for either navigation or robotic navigation. And this is uh, one where uh, robotics and navigation was used with that um, with this particular uh, robotic system that allows live navigation as well. So uh, very nicely written uh, paper, highly recommended. Now, like I said, multiple implants, there's too many to, to really list. And we're just talking about the the uh, lateral SI fusion systems. And then you have all the dorsal, allograft, intraarticular, I call them the intraarticular devices. We don't leave these out. I don't, you know, I don't personally uh, perform these procedures, but uh, just talking about the lateral SI uh, minimally invasive uh, implants, um, you have a bunch of them by a lot of the major companies. Some of them that I put an asterisk next allow decortication of the joint and some don't. And so this may be a question for later on. And um, I know uh, Dr. Cross is, is a believer in this because I read his paper. And so when you look at outcomes, um, this uh, uh, randomized control trial by Dr. Polly and his group, again, uh, much higher success rate in the SI fusion group, improvement in VAS, improvement in ODI are maintained at, uh, at two years. Uh, they did have uh, three revisions in the group. And typically, I quote, incidence of complications of uh, screw complication, one to 2% to my patients. And sometimes you will have to revise the screw. In um, this 12-month uh, uh, follow-up paper, again, uh, looking at uh, low back pain scores, ODI, and functional scores, including, including the EQ5D, superior in the operative group, and results were maintained at 12 months. Like I said, Dr. Cross's paper, an excellent paper with, uh, with a system that allowed the of the joint 
but they also looked at the incidence of bridging bone, which uh, the other papers didn't, uh, just the transfixing papers, and they found almost 80% uh, success in, uh, in finding bridging bone, so actually true radiographic fusion at 12 months. Um, when you look at uh, that uh, meta-analysis, looking at all, following all the papers for VAS and, uh, and uh, ODI, you see significant improvement in VAS at 12 months versus pre-op and similarly for the ODI. And this was uh, the, the uh, meta-analysis by uh, recently published by Dr. Polly's group a couple of years ago. So uh, this is kind of in a nutshell what we do for what VSI joint to me is in the DGEN population. Um, what are the next steps if we if we know that a lot of those patients, post fusion patients, are going to have SI pathology? Do we do something about it or not? I was um, um, our group was part of a big randomized controlled trial looking at uh, actually doing uh, for lung uh, fusion to the ileum, um, adding a, a sacral iliac kind of transfixion or fusion uh, device and. You know, I've just looked at the preliminary data, but uh, the preliminary data tells us that at the, there is a significant amount of baseline patients that also tested positive for SI problems. And so do, do these people need to be treated from the get-go and rather than waiting um, to uh, uh, see them have SI joint problems later? And how about those patients that don't have pre-existing SI problem? If we know that one out of four or one out of three is going to have some SI pathology. Should we look to fuse the SI joint when we take infusions to the ileum? And I think that, um, so this is kind of one of my patients in um, that was in the trial, and you'll see the extra implant there. Uh, this is not something I'm doing currently uh, outside of the trial, but uh, but I'm really interested to look at the data and see. I'm interested in, um, in seeing Dr. Coleman's uh, point of view as it pertains to lung deformity and uh, more complex cases as well. So Thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll take questions at the end, I think. Great. Thanks, Chad. That was, that was uh, fantastic. That was a great review. Really appreciate it. Um, next up is going to be uh, Dr. Cross. Uh, whenever you're ready, Woody. Great. Thanks, Sal. That was a, uh, that was a, a fantastic talk by Dr. Khalil, and I think you'll see some overlap and some uh, some uh, common commonalities between uh, between our thought processes. But just a real thanks uh, to Dr. Patel and LSRS for having me here, just to give kind of a different perspective uh, to the SI joint. And um, I've really been dealing with the SI joint for quite a number of years, which I'll show, and uh, really become a uh, passion of mine, but um, a big uh, a big portion of my practice. I do have a, a conflict, and then I have worked with uh, Mayo Clinic um, to design a system to, to really address all facets of the SI joint. Um, but this talk uh, will be uh, non-biased. Uh, so we'll briefly talk about the sacrum and uh, SI joint and how it relates to me and trauma surgeons, acute injuries, and then what we do with those post-traumatics. I think, you know, why I listen to me, you know, I've started doing fusions um, 2010, 2011. I've done quite a number of them. We built this whole practice at Mayo Clinic specifically with an SI joint clinic where we see people from all over um, that are coming for both primaries and and, and revisions for uh, SI joints that have gone wrong. So we've really kind of um, really investigated it quite a bit. So kind of a simple slide, but, you know, it's kind of what happens in the pelvis. It's a pretzel. And whenever we see trauma in the front, whether it's, you know, rami fractures or symphysial injuries, there is always something in the back. And uh, oftentimes it goes through the SI joint. And this may be back memories from Dr. Khalil and Patel's residencies with these open book pelvic fractures, and they go right through the sacrum or go right through the SI joint. And that's where trauma surgeons get to get right in there and, and access the SI joint and, and, uh, and uh, fix that trauma. We see a lot of injuries to L5 when you see these happen. Then you can see L5 normal on the left there. And then on the buckle fracture, you can see it kind of entrapped and, uh, and hit by the, by the impact there. And you know, this patient does have L5 issues. And uh, so it does... It's right in that area where we uh, where we deal with. So that particular patient um, goes to surgery. Um, this is the outlet view, which we do a lot of these on. There's this one framing in the neural tunnel, and we kind of navigate those screws right across there. This is the inlet view, and it's important, as Dr. Khalil mentioned, you know, the imaging is critical. And you can see right there is the anterior indent of S1, L5 sitting right there. So you have to be behind that to avoid injury to L5. And then again, above S1. And that's the pathway that everybody has. And, and you have to learn to find that on fluoroscopy, or if you have navigation, you can navigate your screws in. 
But then we put the screws in across there, across the SI joint from the ilium. And then as you can see, as we tighten the screw down, you can see us reducing the whole SI joint and ilium back to its anatomic position. This is a really good view also of, uh, of that indent of kind of where L5 is sitting um, to make sure that we're safe. And then this patient also had a small buckle on the other side. And we have the same thing. But what's even more fascinating is look at the hemidysmorphism he has on his right side here, where that indent is all the way back, meaning L5 is all the way back there. So you have to recognize that when you're putting in some of these implants, especially if you want to purchase that really good body of the of the S1 vertebral body or, or S2 if you're, if you're lower. And then we do these transiliac, transsacral screws, which go all the way across the sacrum. And there's that neural tunnel that is between the S1 and S2 foramen. And again, you can navigate that across pretty easily with the uh, interoperative fluoroscopy, or you can use navigation if uh, if you're uh, facile with that. And that's what the post uh, the post reduction uh, inlet view looks like, and that's what his views look like uh, post operatively with uh, with an outlet. Here's a post after the CT scan. You can see that that SI joint and sacrum is pretty well reduced, and that transiliac transsacral screw is right across there in that safe corridor bone, and uh, he's gone on to do well. Same thing with another lady that's crushed by a horse. You can see in the uh, injury film, she has slightly widened on the on the right side and then completely dislocated on her left. And those are her images there after fixation on the right side there. But these ones that have that gross displacement, we do an open uh, SI joint reduction. And so we're doing the lateral window and we can see right down inside the SI joint there. And you can see the entire anterior SI joint ligaments have been avulsed off. And then when you irrigate it out, this comes out, you know, which is a, you know, a three to four centimeter thick piece of cartilage that is essentially the entire hemilunar surface of the SI joint that, that, uh, that Dr. Khalil showed on that uh, diagram. And so when that happens, patients get this horrible post-traumatic arthritis from the shear injuries in their pelvis. So this can be something minor from a uh, LC1 to, these are all pelvic ring type injuries, the LC1s or APC2s and 3s all can have that type of damage. And then you get post, uh, you get CT scans that look like this with terrible sclerosis, vacuum phenomenon, and uh, in some cases, even an unstable, unstable pelvis and flamingo views, which is another um, uh, workup image that I get. You know, kind of look at the SI joint anatomy uh, to review, you know, um, grossly and uh, with with specimens, you know, posteriorly, it is extremely well fortified with a ligamentous complex in the back, and they all have different subparts. But I just refer to them as the as the main posterior ligaments, and then anteriorly, you have a real complex uh, 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 ligament structure with the anterior SI joint ligaments, and then we all know about the iliolumbar ligament, which can be a harbinger of instability because when that pelvis shifts you can have uh, avulsions of that tra uh, transverse process that's holding on to the iliolumbar ligament. So a little hidden thing that we look for, for elements of instability. And then of course, the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligament complex. When you look at the anatomy of the SI joint, this is a you know, gross specimen, and you can see that sort of you know, hemilunar um, uh, uh, format of the anterior joint line. And that fits perfectly with that patient's cartilage that you just saw of what was completely ripped off uh, with her dislocation. So that, uh, and when you look inside the pelvis too, if you're anywhere near the greater sciatic notch when you're doing trauma screws or if you're putting SI joint implants, there is some pretty critical anatomy that you have to look out for. And when you look at kind of this iliac oblique view, that sacral plexus traverses right underneath that uh, greater sciatic notch. And if you look at this picture, I think this also, for those of us that deal with SI joint issues, is exactly why patients are getting these pseudo radiculopathies, because that that perineal division of the sciatic nerve sits right adjacent to the capsule on the SI joint, and if that capsule is inflamed, that's why they get this masquerading of a, of a radiculopathy distally. Um, I think you know this is also another one with these transitional segments and so on. This is what we call in trauma surgery dysmorphism, and it is critical to recognize the dysmorph when you're putting in implants because this is where I see the most neurovascular injuries are with the failure to recognize those transitional segments. And I don't typically count out the vertebral bodies to find out if they have six or if there's lumbarized something or sacralized something. So we simply refer to them as an upper and lower sacral segments. And dysmorphism is really common and you have to really get the outlet radiograph to determine what is a dysmorphic sacrum. These are the five criteria with collinearity, the iliac crest at the upper level of the disc space in the lumosacral junction, 
obliquely oriented kind of res residual transverse processes, really bizarrely shapen sacral and um, anterior neural tunnel exits, a residual disc space between the upper two sacral segments, and a very acute ALR slopes where L5 will often sit. And these are, um, um, like on a lateral view, you see this huge promontory that I pointed here to, which is going to be kind of to fool some people when they're pointing in uh, lateral based implants. And a hallmark of the CT scan, which I'll show you in a minute, is a very big lower sacral segment and a relatively skinny upper sacral segment. So when you look at these on radiographs and volume rendered or service rendered images, you'll see that uh, iliac crest level with the, um, di res the disc at the lumbosacral junction. That's number one. Number two, these little residual transverse processes or mammillary bodies. You'll see these really bizarrely shapen S1 neural foramina. You'll see this residual disc space that is uh, kind of where that transitional anatomy started and these very acute ALR slopes. And those are very prominent on the inlet view, such as the bottom left, to know where you're going to put your implants. When I work up patients for, you know, post-traumatic arthritis and other issues in the SI joint, my standard workup are APs, inlets, and outlets, with the outlet being absolutely key to look for any kind of transitional anatomy and also put those uh, SI joints in profile. They all get the coronal oblique CT scans, which look... They, I don't know why people get like regular coronals, but they don't really make a lot of sense because nothing's in plane in the sacrum and the lumbosacral junction. So this view is in plane with the sacrum and allows you to really look at the pathways nicely as well as the SI joint and then axials. And both of those I use for, uh, for preoperative planning as well. Every single SI joint patient also gets flamingo views. And this is a perfect example of why we get flamingo views with this really incredible um, instability of the anterior pelvic ring, which look at the middle view, you can see the SI joints just sclerotic and lit up in the back. And we also see, you know, the postpartums where this patient you know, has had five children and her pelvis hurt since the second child. She continued to have, have children, but, you know, she's walking around with this chronic diastasis. Her poor SI joints in the back are just uh, uh, given out on her. And that's another common thing that we'll see kind of in this I call it a trauma population because I mean, I think any, any, anybody's had a child knows it's gonna be a traumatic event. It's also key to, to, to know that just imaging alone is not diagnostic for SI joint problems. And a buddy of mine from Fellowship published this article a number of years ago. And if you look at that graph on the right, they describe degenerative changes. And if you look at the age group on the bottom and degeneration of one SI joint, or major generation one SI joint, really anybody over the age of 40 to 50 is gonna have some level of degenerative changes in their SI joint. So imaging alone is useless in looking at these post-traumatic uh, SI joint um, um, issues. It's nice when it clinically correlates, but um, otherwise it doesn't mean much. Interoperatively, when I do trauma, I do them supine. So I have access to the symphysis in the front, which can indirectly reduce the back. When I do them for degenerative conditions, I do them prone. And uh, we combine them with our long segment spine fusions uh, quite often, but uh, but prone is kind of is so much easier for draping. You just kind of kind of operate on your head uh, for a trauma surgeon. And this is us just doing a supine um, kind of get down a stool, look at the uh, look at the monitor, and then when I and this is the inlet view when they're uh, supine, and the inlet view when or the outlet view when they're um, uh, supine. And you can see on the right view the the images that you get with that and how the sacrum is oriented. Um, now, when they're degenerative, I put them prone, and this is the patient prone. That's the PSIS so right up there, and that's kind of how I draw out my proposed incisions when I when I do these types of activities. If, the, if I'm doing, you know, just a, a, a trauma, you know, again, not usually like this, but in some cases you can. Um, this is uh, the inlet view. Then inlets are for anterior posterior adjustments. Your beams coming down the anterior overlying one on two, and that's how you get your perfect looking right down that column. And then the opposite view, the outlet view is going to be for cranial caudal adjustments. And the, the view is going to be like this. And you can see on the right, that's your adjustment. You can see S1, you can see the neural tunnel, and that's your pathway that's always there. And then if you're a little bit confused uh, um, or you just want to double check where you are, I will, will always recommend that you get the lateral view. You know you have a really good lateral when you line up those greater sac notches and they're superimposed over each other. And you want to be posterior to the iliac cortical density line and then posterior to the uh, anterior sacrum. 
Um, again, so here's this dysmorphic. And I think as we go through the CT scan, you can see the tiny, tiny upper sacral segment pathways. And as you go down, you're really going to see the wide open lower sacral segment. So in this particular patient, we would have plenty of access to a transiliate, transsacral screw, or a fusion implant uh, deep into the lower sacral segment. The normal uh, sacrum, now you can see the normal view here as we come down and see a pretty big upper sacral segment where that could easily handle implant all the way into that body without having to go to S2, which is not possible to get anything into, into any type of reasonable bone. Um, so post-traumatic uh, patients, for me and my population, these are the patients that have these you know, uh, uh, maintained screws in place. And if you have a patient that comes in and sees you in your clinic with this picture, you should just take them out and, and see how they do. And it's been shown in several studies that simply removing these implants across an unfused joint can give, give the 80 to 90% of these patients get pain relief by simply removing the implants. This particular patient, however, still had persistent pain. And, you know, injections were positive. She had incredible sclerosis, a vacuum phenomenon across the SI joints and some instability. So we offered her, uh, you know, an SI joint fusion to take away uh, that pain. And, you know, as Dr. Khalil says, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of implants out there. You just choose this one that works best for you and your patients. I like to use one that just completely scrapes out all the cartilage, all of the arthritis inside there, and we just scrape it out and get rid of it and suck it out. This sucks out all the debris. I bone graft it, put the screw all the way into the vertebral body to get that really tight bone and put an anti-rotation screw, blow it, and then I went ahead and did her other side. And uh, that's what she looks like when she's done. And then she gets a post-op uh, CT scan, you know, one or two years later, and she has, you know, robust fusion and, um, and you know, essentially cured her pain. Uh, in the back. So it works so, you know, for the right patient uh, when they have that kind of post-traumatic deformity. And, and I kind of harp on compression and stability. And if you look at those top x-rays on the left, you'll see tongue and groove decking. And if you compress tongue and groove decking, you are going to get essentially instant stability, just like those um, um, histograms show on the, on, the, on, the, on the screw there. So that gives them stability and really good initial pain relief and good, good healing. And then for all of my, this is the same for trauma and fusions uh, for degenerative or acute trauma. Uh, just with standard, usually have them weight bearing is tolerated right off the bat, uh, just because of that strong stability and then just routine imaging and uh, CT scans. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, SI joint pathology is real in the trauma population and otherwise. And I'd love to get into later with the, with the long segment fusions and adjacent segment disease, which essentially SI joint disease is the most caudal aspect of adjacent segment disease. There are other causes. Facetogenic are big ones, and then the hip is a huge one. So if they have evidence of hip disease with a hip exam, which every patient should get, then you always wanna throw in a hip injection to see if the hip's causing it because um, we're getting our series together of doing hip replacements and scopes and osteoplasties for femoral osteomyelitis impingement and curing SI joint disease just with uh, working on the hip. So, um, Anyways, I will uh, we'll end there. And these are topics for uh, some uh, discussion later on um, if there's time. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. That was a great talk. I always love uh, seeing your slides. Uh, learn a ton from from listening to you talk. So thanks thanks very much. Our next speaker is going to be Matt Coleman. Uh, Matt's going to talk about the role of the SI joint fusion in uh, deformity surgery. Uh, thanks so much, Matt, for joining us tonight. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I, a phenomenal first couple of talks there. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how these concepts apply to deformity and my experience in deformity. Um, I don't have any um, disclosures that are relevant other than we participated also in that um, SI bone study called Sylvia, which I'll talk a little bit about in this talk um, and got some research grant to do that. So um, <clears throat> background here for deformity is that, you know, pelvic fixation, pelvic screws, are such a comfort blanket for degenerative and deformity surgeons. Um, whenever I have problems at the 5-1 joint or I have a big, long, stiff fusion, um, it just gives me this sense of security to put these big, long, 100 millimeter, 9, 10 millimeter screws in. But, um, you know, there's a reason There's a reason we feel that way, right? Because that, the, you know, these pelvic fixation screws have, have really helped us fix a lot of revision scenarios, and they've also really reduced the 5-1 pseudo rate in long deformity. Um, 
But you know, what's hidden underneath that cup comfort blanket is that these screws actually have a surprisingly high incidence of failure. And I'm not painting them as a as a as a bad thing necessarily, but I think what people need to know is that they do fail, they do loosen, and they do cause SI joint dysfunction. Um, furthermore, S2 AI screws and you know, obviously they're going across the SI joint. They do not result in SI joint fusion. Um, one, one recent study showed a 0% arthrodesis rate and actually accompanied with 45% SI joint pain. So that's sort of a, a negative categorization of these, of this, of this very comforting, uh, useful fixation technique. So what's, so the purpose of this talk is to kind of talk a little bit more about why that might be and what some of the implications are. Um, Interest has really arisen, you know, in adding fusion devices to S2AI screws in order to protect the S2AI screws, prevent pelvic screw failure, and really, if we could just get the SI joint fu uh, joint to fuse, then maybe we eliminate a lot of that SI joint dysfunction and deformity. Um, you know, the the incidence of that SI joint dysfunction. Obviously, there's issues with diagnosis. But it's pretty high. It's it's reported from ten to thirty three percent in uh, most of the more recent studies. And then when we look at iliac screw fixation failure and standard deformities without SI joint fusion, um, we we have a, a similarly alarming rate of S of iliac screw failure. So um, a multi center group recently. This is very recent. This came out this year, um, which we were a part of. Sort of gathered a, a cohort of over 700 cases to just look at what happens with the SI, with the pelvic screw failure. And again, this is no SI joint fusion. This is just deformity cases with S2AIs and pelvic bolts. 5% acute failure within six months of the sur index surgery. Um, the majority of them are rod slipping or a cap popping off, but there's definitely some shank fractures and some loosening. Um, when you do an inner body at L5S1, or you use big long screws, or you use multiple screws, or you use multiple rods, you obviously protect those screws from failing. And I think a lot of that's pretty intuitive. Um, An independent risk factor for screw failure is just a large pre-op deformity. The more, the more you're correcting and the more stress you're putting on that pelvic base, the more likely are the screws are to fail. And there was actually one specific implant manufacturer, which you can email me about after my talk, um, if you wanna know. Um, uh, that was identified as a risk factor. So what else do we know? What, 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 how about some more background here? Um, you know, we, we know that, I, I guess I, what I want to communicate with this slide is that we have to think about the SI joint, and, and the other speakers alluded to this, we have to speak about the SI joint as an adjacent segment. You know, most of us historically have just considered L5S1 the last adjacent segment. Once that's gone, once it's fused, once it's stable, you're done. It's probably not the case. The SI joint is a real joint. The motion isn't comparable, but it really does. It really is an adjacent segment. And so this data kind of makes sense. You know, degenerative patients that have stiffened lumbar spines actually see increased motion at the SI joint. Dubasay um, recognized that an intact mobile SI joint was actually important for his achievement of arthrodesis in deformity patients. So this is a picture of one of his base of deformity screws, um, which is kind of like not really a screw that's used much anymore, but it's an iliosacral screw that doesn't go across the joint. It like stabilizes the segment and provides a base without providing arthrodesis. So he sort of recognized that a mobile adjacent segment at the SI joint um, leads to better fusion rates, which I think is pretty astounding considering that we're still talking about it in 2023. So what do we know about biomechanics here? I, I want to go through a couple papers. Um, this is a, a, a neat um, cadaver study that compared an intact specimen, S1 and S2 Ehler screws without SI joint fusion, or crossing rather, um, iliac screws without SI joint crossing, and S2 AI screws. So as expected, the more fixation you put that's not across the SI joint, the more the SI joint is going to move. So that's kind of intuitive. Um, it's it's your adjacent segment. Um, when you put SI, S2AI screws across the SI joint, you reduce some motion at the SI joint, but not much. 75 to 80% of the motion still remains. 
So I think that's kind of striking that these S2 AI joint screw, these S2 AI screws do not limit motion at the SI joint. And then when you look at actual implants to try to fuse the SI joint in comparison to what happens with just a standard S2 AI screw, it's pretty clear that like putting three dowel implants in limits the motion of the SI joint much more than just putting a single screw over it. So multiple points of fixation. That, I think that's pretty intuitive as well. Now, when we, this is kind of a more modern approach and, and Jed uh, referred to it. Um, when we have an S2AI screw and then we add a dowel, a fusion dowel in addition to that screw, we probably protect the S2AI screw from failure, which makes sense. We're just adding fixation across that same corridor. But the more robust you make that SI joint, the more you increase rod strain. And actually just the two points of fixation don't, which is kind of, I thought this was kind of interesting. The two points of fixation don't really limit S2AI or, or don't really limit SI joint motion. But maybe that's because this is a cadaver and we don't have the opportunity for, for arthrodesis stability. So this is just like a static, two static implants put in don't really limit the motion compared to its S2AIs alone. So it's just some interesting biomechanic data that, that tells me S2AIs don't limit SI joint motion and don't cause a fusion. And then using the SI joint implants to stiffen up the SI joint and really remove that motion it probably protects the S2AI screws, but it gets us thinking, hey, if we see higher rod strain at L5S1, what about the other adjacent segments? And I'm getting into that uh, in a second. So before I do, I wanted to just go over kind of a how we can possibly fuse the SI joint if that's your goal. And I'm not sure that should be our goal, at least in deformity. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. But if you want to do it, you can just burr out the joint because you're already open. You can actually expose the joint and, and, and burr it and pack it. Um, certainly, you can use percutaneous transiliac um, fixation devices, which have been talked about already. We can use these S1. I call them S1A1 because they're sort of placed, um, and I'll show you some pictures, but they're sort of placed just above the S2AI screw, sort of from the S1 ailer segment across the SI joint. And then we can consider actual, rather than dowels, we can do some combination implant where, where it's sort of like a fusion screw that might core out some bone and, and try to achieve some fusion, but it also has a tulip head, so it acts like a screw. So this is what I mean about the, and this, this is a similar picture to what was shown earlier. We, we placed the S2AI screw and we put a dowel um, to accompany it to actually go for a fusion. And this is one of the first papers to report on the results. They did 42 navigated insertions and you had they had three malposition events, even under navigation, that were corrected um, because they were recognized and corrected. Um, the screws are pretty easy to put in under navigation. My experience participating in the Sylvia study, the SI bone study, is that these dowels are really, really straightforward, especially if you've got navigation up and running um, to place. And just a technical note, you know, if you put your S2AI screw on this picture on the right, if you put your S2AI screw in the middle of the teardrop, you leave yourself very little room for the dowel. So we try to put the S2AI a little lower in the teardrop, and then it gives us plenty of room to put the dowel in. And this is, this is one of these combination implants. There's a couple companies that make these. I don't have any conflicts with them. Um, but this is like, you know, a coring sort of ingrowth 3D printed device with a tulip head. So you can just use that. I would submit that this might cause a little local fusion, but one point of fixation probably doesn't cause a robust SI joint fusion. So I'm going to finish with just talking a little bit about sort of what we know and what we don't know about the implications of actually achieving a fusion at the SI joint and deformity. Um, just to take a step back, we know that when we do a, a big, long, stiff construct, Actually, this this sort of goes against dogma. The, the pelvic incidence, which really just describes how the sacrum is set in the pelvis, it shouldn't be a changeable value. But we know that when we create this big stiff lever arm um, with T10 to pelvis or whatever deformity operation you're doing, um, the pelvic incidence does change. And again, this is an adjacent segment. 
Okay, so we have to think about it like that. If you do get an SI joint fusion, and this is a finite element study, what's the adjacent segment after the SI joint? Well, it's the hip. So this is what we have to kind of think of at this point when we're trying to get a, a robust fusion across the SI joint and the rest of the spine is fused as well. So there's paper after paper that have come out recently talking about this, th this notion of if you fuse the SI joint and you're in deformity setting, maybe the hip is actually your next adjacent segment. So very intriguing. I, I think that with more robust sacropelvic immobility, meaning you really try for an SI joint fusion in the setting of deformity and you get it to stop moving, um, maybe your hip joint disease accelerates um, both in native hips or reconstructed hips. Perhaps there's um, instability issues we need to think about. And this is totally unknown. So this is this is areas for future study. Um, furthermore, the, the, the thing that plagues us so much and we don't have a good solution to, is that going to get worse when we do this intervention, when we get a robust SI joint fusion? Is my PJF, uh, my acute failure of that upper instrument of vertebrae or, or UIV type plus one, is that going to get worse? And then are we going to start seeing new patterns of sacral insufficiency fractures, loss of, you know, maybe that, maybe when you do a big deformity case, you really need that SI joint flexibility to accommodate a pelvic incidence change. Um, maybe you lose that ability and what implications does that have? So um, I'm really, the, you know, the data hasn't been published on the Sylvia study, um, which is again, the, the, the dowel plus an S2AI screw prospective randomized, very, very robust design as SI bone is known for. Um, and again, I have no conflict with them, but we're all pretty excited to see what the longer term data from this study shows, because I think we're going to see, and it needs to be looked at critically. I think we're going to see some unintended consequences of taking this approach and, and, and we really need to, to hash that out. So um, in summary, you know, SI fusion implants in the setting of deformity seem like they protect the S2AI and pelvic screws. Um, it seems like they'll prevent some of the acute failure and they may, they may present some pelvic, uh, some SI joint dysfunction. Um, there's a variety of ways you can try to go for an SI joint fusion, but I would, I think the, the best data is for multiple points of fixation and true fusion implants. Um, uh, and, you know, we're just looking forward to the future clinical studies. So I'm going to end, um, and I think we're going to move into a question section. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. That was great. Uh, we really appreciate um, all the all the talks that were given. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, there's one from uh, uh, Dr. Butt. Uh, he asked if there's any utility of post-op CT scans if the patients are, aren't having any clinical complaints, I'm assuming beyond research. Any Anyone can answer this question. We typically don't don't get them. I think I was looking at uh, <clears throat> with these slides and said twelve months CT. Maybe uh, um, maybe maybe they get them. I'm not sure. I'll have them answer next. But we we typically don't don't get them in asymptomatic people who do well. Those that don't do well, we want to look for pseudarthrosis and obviously those with any uh, ridiculous symptoms, we would obtain CT scan immediately. We get them, yeah, we certainly offer them to patients. Um, if they are completely asymptomatic, I offer, I offer to get one at 12 months to evaluate fusion status. Um, and a lot of them do have concomitant low back disease. And if they have an increase in low back disease, because we know from a recent study done by uh, uh, Reza Fruzabadi that SI joint fusions in native backs does drive increased 5-1 facet issues. So um, if they're getting back pain up there, we will check it at that um, um, 12 and sometimes 24 month mark. But um, certainly I think the argument is easy to make that you would not need to get one in an asymptomatic patient that's doing well. Um, hey, what do you, you probably do these for uh, the most diverse set of pathologies. Um, do you see the people getting symphyseal pain um, after their SI joints fuse? And we talk about the next joint down being the hip, but the symphysis definitely sees probably more stress, I'm assuming, if there's um, uh, no pain in the SI joints? I haven't seen any uh, anterior base pain. And they do get the symphysis is a more mobile joint than uh, than the SI joint for sure. In the, the uh, When I do this, the flamingo views, the a physiologic movement is two to three millimeters of symphyseal adjustment. 
patients in the SI joint have, if you look at those studies, you can find a lot of different range of motions. The one I like to quote, I think was well done, only shows about one millimeter at the most of displacement and 0.5 degrees of rotatory stability. So the SI joint doesn't affect that. And it's the hips, the degrees of freedom of the hip uh, a far outweigh that of the SI joint. So I have never seen it go south. Um, it always goes north though. And then the, if the hips go, like I alluded to, the hips go bad, they can drive the SI joint to go crazy. So if you fix the SI joint, it doesn't fix the hip. And I think that'll adversely affect your outcome of your SI joint fusion if they still have that hip pain. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, also, uh, another question. We all use diagnostic injections, you know, 75% relief on more than one injection as, as our criteria for SI joint pathology being the, the culprit. Um, but how specific is it in the setting of other degenerative conditions that you see in the spine? So if someone has some um, modic changes at L5S1, uh, slight degen scoli, um, even some hip arthritis down below, how, how specific is that? Do you find that even if people get 80% relief, you do the fusion, you have a lower rate of success because diagnostically that test is just not as accurate? Once again, open question for anybody. I'll take it, Brock. I think I think that's an excellent question, and um, it just um, it, I think it's impossible to give it, it just one answer. It's just kind of be an ex, an experienced physician. That's what it teaches you. And the reason we do seventy five, I mean, I mean, it's not really seventy five. I want to see the pain gone, really. And what I tell most of my patients that have a multitude of um, of etiologies for their pain is. I'm trying to find out what's causing you the most pain here and whether it's treatable or not. And most patients will have more than one reason. And if it's SI joint, there could be also, say, modic changes, degenerative disc disease, facet joint disease. And and the, the only way I'll do a, um, in, uh, I will address the SI joint surgically is if the injection provides so much relief that they say, you know, I forgot about my pain for a couple hours. And and so it's important to also instruct them what to do with after the injection. And it's not to just lay down and rest. It's go do the things that bother you. If it's gardening, go garden. If it's riding your bicycle, whatever it is that aggravates you normally, you try to do it after the injection for a few hours. And whatever pain relief you got, you may expect to um, you may expect to get up to that relief um, if you had your um, SI joint fused. The, the exam that you pointed out, I tell my patients that that exam serves two purposes. Number one, to diagnose, to diagnose it. Number two, to fire up their SI joint so then they get a lot of relief from the injection. And uh, so that's kind of the role of injection. And when I get injections too, I you always, you can start off with the SI joint, but if you think there's stenosis above, hit those levels too. You always want to inject the most caudal level until they don't get relief. And so if they, if they get relief at four, if they get relief at five, they get relief of the SI, you know, it's probably the SI um, because you're probably anesthetizing part of the SI innervation by getting a more proximal or caudal or cranial um, um, injection. So I think there's some interplay with that. And then uh, then I'm not a big buyer of the of 70. I w obviously, I love 75% or greater, but I'm not a big buyer of the has to be 75% above or, or insurance won't approve it. They have to have some result that that they're like if i could live like this i want that done to me and that's why i try and uh, that's what i try and harp on the most great so i have a question from dr aleem uh he was asking if uh there's any uh literature showing a difference in fusion rates and si joint procedures where the si joint is decorticated in bone graft uh, versus um, uh, procedures where you don't take the time to decorticate and bone graft the SI joint? And also, does that translate to clinical results? Any comparative studies that anyone's aware of? I'm not. I'm, I'm not either. I know that other, it depends on how you, I think bridging bone can be one little spicule of bridging bone, or it can be abundant fusion mass. Um, I do think it is clear that other methods work. And, and it, in, so that's the debate of transfixation versus our true arthrodesis. Those are the two concepts that are out there. And you have to pick one that works for you and your patients. And in, if you look at failure modes of implants, it's oftentimes ALR loosening. Um, and when they get ALR loosening, that's because there's no purchase in that. But the bone and the Hounsfield units of the ALA, is zero, I mean, it's zero. 
and and that's where they loosen. But in some patients that are fortunate to have dense ALR bone, those transfixation devices probably work okay, uh, but not everybody. So that's where I really think you know the getting a fusion mass. I mean, I think if we look at the success rates of a five one fusion, we're looking for we're looking for bridging bone and pain relief. If patients come back with pain and there's no bridging bone at five one. You know, then you call it a, you call it a pseudoarthrosis, and they get revised. So I, I kind of follow a little bit of that philosophy, but um, but I do I do one hundred percent agree that transfixation devices work in some people. Yeah, I'm not I'm not aware of any comparative studies. I mean, that's a it's a good point. I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, the transfixing studies having uh, clear documentation of bridging bone, but then the second part of the question does it work. I agree with Dr. Cross. I mean, I think I think done right for the right indication. Um, that's more important than uh, the actual implant that you're using. Uh, you need to get multiple points of fixation, get solid fixation across the SI joint, and not like two little threads of 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 an implant. And and we'll see it pretty often, you know, because. People who do quite a bit of SI work will see also the revisions, people that weren't happy with their fusion. And sometimes everything was done right, but sometimes you'll see like the screw stop at the SI joint and not even across it. And I think, and, and I wonder, that's a question to Dr. Cross. He probably has more more um, experience than any of us is, do you think that, if, because I've seen a few patients in my career that they have one of those screws or maybe two of those screws that just stop at the joint and those patients are really fired up and their SI joint had never gotten any better. That, that that's often the case. You know, then then they have this, this that happens when implants are using three, two or three or four implants, and they have one that's all the way across, and then they have one that's barely across, and then one's in the ilium. So now they have one point of fixation in there, and that SI joint still rocking around that one point of fixation. And I think, and that's where they get the halo, and that's where they get their pain. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's. That's absolutely what happens. Well, uh, uh, any if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the Q and A. Scott, do you have any questions for these guys, or should we let them go? <laughs> no, I can't really think of anything to add. I guess I, the, the only question I had was, and um, you know, when when you look at some of the literature on the the sort of the SI joint being the adjacent segment after a fusion, you know, we talked. Uh, I think uh, you know. It, in that first talk, I mean, I'm just curious with some of those studies looking at at that. Is it only with a fusion to S1, or do you see increased stress with longer fusions above it? You know, leaving you know if you don't fuse L5 S1, and, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, theoretically, again, it's more stress on on everything there, but it's just getting absorbed by your L5 S1 level, and that's your adjacent level. Um, yeah, Scott, most of the most of the studies that I've seen either go to to one or the, actually more than one. They were like one plus ilium, yeah, one plus S one a S two ailer, those kind of things. Um, I mean, the L five S one joint is so mobile; it, it you know it makes sense to me. If you leave that open, you know you're probably going to take most of your motion through that. Just looking at comparative motion, but. But you, I think your your talk, you know, Matt and uh, and John hit the hit it right on. We just started a uh, we just got funding and got the IRB through for a randomized prospective study of doing you know the true fusion with long segment constructs. And uh, we're going to have patients that pre existing SI, um, and then asymptomatic patients, kind of prophylactic fixation, and then follow them up. I think that you know if we look at all of our clinics, I mean, I think in my clinic anyway half. If not more of my patients are stas post long segment or even four to ones. I mean, it it is the real deal. And so there's something going on there with that with that force transfer. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what we should, uh, as we look at that, we should we should not forget to look above and below to your point. Yeah. And you know, to well, piggyback a little bit on on Matt's talk is um, for the longest time, I mean, we know that if you stop at S1 or stop at L5, you're increasing that incidence of degeneration of the SI, but we don't know. We for the past maybe, I think since I was a resident, we started doing S two AI screws more than iliac. So that's probably about you know 14, 15 years now of us putting a screw across the the SI joint uh, to provide iliac fixation because we like those screws. They line up with the rest of the construct instead of doing 
you know, the old school iliac screw with the cross connector, but we're putting something across the SI joint and we're actually putting a screw in the ilium for the longest time that's not really designed for the ilium. It's just a long pedicle screw. So the, on, on the one hand, that screw will loosen up because the iliac channel, the iliac bone channel is pretty wide. On the other hand, we're actually putting, you know, kind of violating the SI joint without doing anything. So it just makes sense to do something. And just in the past few years, we started thinking about what is, I don't think we have the answer what to do. Do you put a companion screw? Do you actually decorticate the joint posteriorly? Do you do something laterally? And I think um, all options are on the table now. And I think within the next few years, it's going to be exciting to see what comes out of um, all those studies. One more, one more quick comment on that. I mean, I, I totally agree. And I, th I think um, as I've learned more about this topic, I actually have become more bearish on trying to get this huge, robust SI fusion just to get it in a deformity. I think anybody, anybody that's put a bunch of S2AI screws in and sometimes does some iliac fixation without crossing the joint will probably agree that um, a modern iliac bolt that's sort of tucked into the inner table is so similar. It is so similar to an S2AI screw in its position and its ability to be in line that I almost am intrigued that, or maybe we'll see as more data comes out on this, maybe we'll see people move more to that screw. And, and less to a crossing screw and a, and a fusion and an attempt at fusion. I don't know, but it's just, I, I just think the iliac, the iliac bolt in a modern configuration actually looks a lot like an S2AI screw. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we're past nine o'clock. Uh, thank you again. Any of the attendees, if you have any suggestions uh, for future topics, please feel free to reach out to, to Katie. Uh, or anyone on the education committee um, uh, at LSRS, and we're, we're happy to to pick topics that everyone's interested in. So.